Hi, everyone. Welcome to this April 18th, 2023 uh, business meeting of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And can everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. I'd like to um, first look at correspondence. Ms. Santos. We have an email from Abby Archdeacon on police presence at the high school up from 331. Thank you. And now let's turn it over to Dr. Yanni for the superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski, and good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to, spring sport is in full session, and I want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Donahue and his team for the outstanding work that they've been doing since uh, last a year and a half. When, when I approached Mr. Donahue uh, more than a year ago to put a broadcasting team together, he did not blink. He put something together out of nothing, and now is becoming an amazing way to have parents follow our athletes, um, and it's truly uh, is better than watching ESPN because it's our own students, our own sports, our own athletes. So uh, listening to the students commenting on the game is truly remarkable. So thank you to Mr. Donahue and his entire team. Thank you. Um, first grade social studies night is becoming a tradition. So on March 30th, um, we had the second annual first grade social studies night. Students and parents had an opportunity to learn about their school's namesake, Theodore Roosevelt, and the contribution as the 26th president of the United States. The Royal Kappa Honor Society students prepared creative activities, and uh, Principal McElwee, uh, McElwee uh, partner our school with the Theodore Roosevelt Association of Oyster Bay to support the Teddy Bears for Kids program that partners with hospitals around the country to raise money to purchase teddy bears for sick children. Uh, that's truly remarkable. And all in all, it was a great night. So thank you to Ms. McCowie, uh, Ms. Bader, and the entire social studies department. Thank you. We have something pretty much in every building, so very proud of our students. On March 31st, fifth graders from the James Vernon School invited parents and friends to examine their windmill, pro with windmill projects. Uh, this was part of a unit on the engineering design process, and I know that Mr. Moore is going to talk about tonight in his presentation. The project was inspired by a book that they read and the main character worked together to solve the problem. So students had to ask, plan, create, uh, and improve to design, create a blueprint, and ultimately, ultimately create a, their windmills. They also created videos, and it was quite remarkable to see how proficient they are with the use of creating videos with iMovies. Uh, they tested the windmills and then presented to the parents. So it was a, it was a great uh, event and a, a great tradition that is becoming right now at, at Vernon. So thank you all. Um, ancient civilization, uh, March 31st, the sixth graders at Vernon presented the ancient civilization pro project. Uh, they dressed up as the person that they researched and they presented to all the parents in attendance. So um, was quite fortunate to visit with the entire team uh, everybody did a wonderful job. So great job on that. <laughs> Student Athletic Leadership Program, South, uh, visited a fifth grade class. This is pretty much the older uh, students visiting the younger children. Um, each time the students uh, from the high school visit their fifth and sixth grade, they give presentation on various topics. Uh, this was the third visit at Vernon and they discussed the danger of drugs, alcohol, tobacco, vaping um, to the future middle school uh, students. They also discussed strategies or to avoid an handling situation they may put themselves in, in danger. 
So the student athletes serve as a role model and we are proud of their work and, and obviously uh, becoming truly a role model for, for our future um, high schoolers and middle schoolers. So thank you for the, um, for the South program students. Uh, Board of Education goals that every month uh, we'll give an update on what's going on in our schools. Uh, so tonight we'll hear uh, presentations from uh, Mr. Moy, the science supervisor, and Ms. Beta, uh, the humanities director. And then uh, later on you'll hear a presentation from Ms. Uh, Raynor about uh, budget adoption. So at this point I'd like to invite to the podium, I don't want to go out of order, I think the next one is the art recognition first. Uh, do you so, mind if I ask you a question before yeah. we start there? Um, the broadcasting room, just so everyone knows, when do you think that's going to be completed? So the broadcasting studio um, is going to be completed at the end of uh, the summer, twenty. this coming summer, 23. Um, should be ready to go in September for the opening of schools. And also, do you want to inform the people of the turf field? Um, yes. Uh, turf field, we're going to have a, a cutting um, ribbon cutting ceremony on April 29th at 9 a.m. So we invited the entire community to attend. Um, we've been, uh, we're going to formally um, kind of open up the field, which we're very excited about. I think my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at this point, we have also um, in the arts, we have a recognition of our talented artist, and I see a lot of students over here, so I'm very proud to welcome to the podium uh, Ms. Uh, Erica Giopak, our supervisor of uh, Fine and Performing Arts. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So this is all the good stuff. It's so great to be able to share in the recognition of our K through 12 artists. I am so thrilled to recognize these talented, driven and passionate young artists who stand before us. They have been given lots of honors and awards. They've been part of a lot of public exhibits in our community and throughout Long Island. So students, as I call you to receive the award, you're gonna just follow the traffic pattern we talked about and head towards the end of the stage. And then we'll all take a picture together at the end. Um, if you joined us a little bit later and you are a student artist receiving an award, just make your way to one of the first three rows here so you have a nice pathway. Okay. So I also um, put up the students' work as I'm calling their names so you can enjoy some of the amazing creations that they've made. So these are just some of the awards and honors and exhibitions our K through 12 students have been a part of this year. It's quite a list. So I would like to start with our AP art students who were part of the Go Ape Art League of Long Island Advanced Placement Exhibit. And I would like to call up to the stage and recognize, oh, got a little trigger happy there, Miss Riley Ford, Paige Sweeney, and Grace Maldonado. Also, we have at the Art Guild, um, Ava DeAngelis, Grace, and Paige as well. So I'd like to bring Ava up to the stage. So this next exhibition was all county. This was all of Nassau County. And this represents our K through 12 artists. So here we have Caitlin Petrello or in kindergarten, Jonah Smith in first grade, Mackenzie Callie in second grade. Please come to the stage.
I would also like to welcome to the stage from the same all-county exhibit, Anna Larita, Emma Kim, and Jeffrey Zhang. And there's their work on display. So the work is in order of the students' names on the, on the display. Also sharing in the All County Art Exhibit, William Noble in eighth grade, Sophia Stafos, and Julia Milos. And then we have Taylor Torres, Savannah King, and Joseph LaRosa for our all-county artists. And the last of our all-county artists, as you can see, obviously we're going in grade order here, William Amiyama. Rebecca Castillo, and Grace Maldonado, who also won the senior scholarship. Congratulations. So next up, we have the New York State Art Teachers Association legislative exhibit. This is a really big one. And we, again, this is a K through, you're very excited to see your work up there, I know. This is your K through 12 students who are part of the legislative exhibit. So we have Charlotte Hen, Isabella Hernandez Gonzalez, Mark Voivodich, and Amelia Brogue. Please come to the stage. You're really happy. Yeah. And in the same exhibit, Madison Morley, Elkim Abode, and Nicoletta Sikalis. And the last set of students who are part of this legislative exhibit is Marco Vladich, Kaylee Shaw, and Laura McKevitt. I know, it's a tight squeeze. <laughs> it's got right there. It was easier for the little ones to get through there. And Laura. So the next exhibit I wanted to uh, commend the students for being a part of is the LIU Post Advanced Visions um, exhibit. Grace Maldonado and Paige Sweeney were part of this. They're already on stage, but I did just want to show you their incredible work up there. Right now, currently on display, you can go see it at Five Towns College. This is the Long Island Media Arts Show. We have Rebecca Castillo's work. Nancy Abode, and Mauricio Reyes Canales. Um, we also have on display Ryan Barone, Nicholas Andrianopoulos, and Claudia Torres' work. They're not here, so I'm just gonna go through these slides. And Paige, Laura McKevitt, and Grace Maldonado, who were already represented on stage, um, that was their work. So we're very proud. And if you have time to go to Five Towns College, you can check out their work on display. And this next one is a really, really big one. Um, this is the Long Island's Best Young Artists, and this is shown at Heckscher Museum of Art. There were almost 500 kids who applied to be in this exhibit in Nassau and Suffolk County combined, and only 90 students were selected, and two Oyster Bay students were selected, and that is Miss Grace Maldonado and Miss Ava DeAngelis. Thank you. 
and their work is incredible. Grace's is a sculpture, which you can't really appreciate in that picture, but it is so unbelievable. And Ava's incredible piece right beside it. So we are so proud of our students and all the work that is still happening. These are all the upcoming art events, so stay tuned for more. And I must just thank their most incredible teachers, two of which are here tonight, Miss Miley and Miss Brussman. But here are all their amazing art teachers who we're so proud of too. Thank you so much. Now we're going to have Mr. Moy for a science update. Mr. Moy is our supervisor of science. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Yanni, and thank you to the Board of Ed. And uh, hard to follow all the smiles from the little kids, so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll try our best. So in science, we always look for patterns, so you might see some themes or some recurring issues uh, throughout the presentation. Um, but this is, uh, we're going to take a look at what is being done to support student achievement K-12, uh, starting in the primary grades and moving up through Vernon to the high school. Okay, so at Roosevelt, <coughs> students use the Amplify Science curriculum to ask questions and observe the world around them. They begin their journey to make sense of phenomena. Students at Roosevelt have had a variety of experiences engaging with the local community to make seed pods and understand pollen pollinators and local pollinators, uh, as well as identify animals through the Nature Company. Uh, you can actually see some of these seed pods. They will be growing at Roosevelt. Uh, they're, they're going to be planted soon since uh, the weather's getting nicer. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Second grade science night was back to being in person this year, uh, so where students engage in a variety of activities and challenges connected to the NISLIS or New York State Science Learning Standards. Current and prospective Science National Honor Society students help facilitate each workshop at the building. Uh, and as always, I want to thank uh, Ms. Diorio for, for putting that all together. In Ms. Diorio's class, pictured here, students also engaged in engineering design practices, so using the design process to solve a problem. Last month, uh, part of uh, what we're looking to instill in the district is having our older students come down to our younger students, just as Dr. Yanni talked about the SALP program. So our high school robotics team actually gave uh, demonstrations of their robot to not only the kindergartners, but also uh, the students at Vernon Elementary as well. Uh, and part of the work here is to inspire the next generation of en engineers and roboticists. All right, moving on to James Vernon Elementary. Again, we follow a similar theme, so our students move deeper into inquiry and are consistently asked, what are you noticing? And what are you thinking? And they're working collaboratively to actually work through all of the phenomena, all the experiments that they're looking at in their classrooms, and uh, also with Ms. Murray in, in our science special for third and fourth grade. At Vernon, they begin to develop a process and a way to explain their thoughts through claims, evidence, and reasoning, similar to a strategy that you'll hear from uh, Director Bader for the humanities uh, in, in the next presentation. So students begin to use evidence that they've collected to justify a claim or to make a counterclaim. In Ms. Murray's third and fourth grade class, students have that safe environment to enter scientific discourse and collaborate with each other. A lot of times pictured here, they, they'll sit in a 
in a circle and actually debate or scientifically scientifically argue with each other. Um, it's really you know amazing to see third and fourth graders in a kind and respectful way disagree with their peers and use evidence from their experiments to do so. At the end of March, uh, just like Dr. Yanni said, so our, our fifth grade students presented their windmill engineering projects to families and, and the community. Uh, so they were presented with a problem. Uh, windmills always have to do some sort of work, right? So our engineering design process, there's always some problem. This one was, it had to do some sort of work. In the real world, it's generally creating electrical energy for us. Uh, our, our teachers here, they decided to have them lift certain amounts of weight uh, a certain distance. Uh, I believe, I, I know I saw one student, they were excited when they got up to 500 grams, which is about a pound. So their windmills, just using a box fan, were, were lifting a pound of, of weight, uh, about, about a meter high or three feet tall. For that, I want to thank uh, Ms. Hauser, Mr. Somo, and Ms. Gentile for uh, bringing our students through that design process uh, and adhering to our engineering standards and giving students the time and space to be creative, design their own logos and companies, and actually walk away with a product that they were proud to display for the community. Uh, for the birds, uh, right before the break, uh, in our partnership with the Audubon Society um, with, uh, we had Julie Nelson and, and Roxanne come from the Theodore Roosevelt Sanctuary and Audubon Center to discuss not only structure and function of birds, how to identify birds, but actually take the students on field experiences on the property of, at Vernon uh, to do bird watching. One student told me that they saw robins, they saw finches, and they even saw a blue house. I, I asked if there, were, if there were wings or feathers on that house, but the, the student just said, no, it was just a blue house. The, um, our other partnerships that uh, we had our four, uh, third grade and, and, and fifth grade look at uh, comes from the Waterfront Center, so right here in the Bay, uh, for environmental lessons where, again, students get to see their local environment and their local in their local community. In December, STEM night was a huge success. Uh, so an evening for students at Vernon, so grades three to six, where students can come and go through engineering activities, technology activities, uh, as well as the main hit of the night, a presentation from Mad Science, uh, cooling down certain things where, uh, you know, you can see here a cloud of nice smoke listing into the crowd uh, where students actually got to see uh, temperature changes in the extreme right there in front of them. So again, kind of the phenomena that they can possibly see in the real world and, and have kind of the excitement with it. I believe they also looked at ghost bubbles. Um, I've, I've never seen ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts, but they, they had a lot of fun doing that. All right, moving on to the high school. So uh, again, our focus and kind of our theme with our New York State standards, we're always looking at claims, evidence, and reasoning. So we're always looking to justify our claim, always justifying our argument, because that's one of those transferable uh, skills in any content area. And specifically in science, uh, it's one that we want to use authentic data uh, all, the, all the time. So using that authentic data from lab investigations, they're justifying explanations of phenomena. They're looking at relationships in nature that they're observing. Uh, here or pictured here, we have our chemistry students working through how to identify different compounds. So not just working through a dichotomous key that they've learned in, in the past, but as well as developing their protocols to actually go through uh, this process. Uh, on the left, uh, one of my personal favorites uh, that I've seen uh, in the classroom this year uh, is an, was, an, was a physics piece. I'm, I'm a physics guy, so of course the, this one really hit home for me. Students actually looking through and working through developing and testing and retesting and redesigning an electrical circuit, but with a creative artistic sense in a holiday greeting card. So not only did they get to apply the knowledge that they were learning in the class and do uh, calculations to estimate what they needed, but it also gave a little bit of artistic sense to uh, what they were doing. I'm pretty sure I saw a, a fictional reindeer with a lighting nose, um, so that was, that was always enjoyable to see. Okay, field experiences. Uh, our, stu our students at the high school also go to the Waterfront Center and, and partner there. Uh, which we'll talk about in, in a second. Pictured here uh, recently, our AP Biology students went uh, down the road to Cold Spring Harbor to the DNA lab, um, where students were actually uh, running 
uh, I'll say a fingerprint for their own cheek cells. Uh, you know, they had to sign consent and everything, uh, but they were able to actually uh, run through a gel electrophoresis. They actually codified uh, their own DNA. What's been nice is that students come back from some of these field experiences or, um, or even some of our research uh, pieces, coming back, understanding and learning and telling us that they've used some of the equipment already. So they have kind of that leg up. So it's one of the special things here at Oyster Bay. So the micro pipetting uh, that you can see students doing here, they've done in their classrooms, uh, not only in our research classes, but, but also in our, our AP biology class. Other partnerships uh, that we have uh, throughout the local community, again, the Waterfront Center, so our marine biology students go there uh, in high school. Uh, some of our middle level research students went to the Audubon Center and, and worked through uh, cleaning up the native species and the gardens there. They're going to be returning for work in the spring. Uh, and we had a local astronomer, uh, amateur astronomer, come in to show some of uh, his photographs of heavenly bodies and things that you can see in the night sky throughout New York State uh, with our astronomy students. And of course, I reordered my pages. Here we go. Uh, so academic competition. So our students begin, uh, at least at the high school, with our seventh grade science fair that took place this year in January uh, to engage in academic competitions. So winners from that uh, went on to middle level uh, or middle school level LISA for Long Island Science and Engineering Fair, uh, or they went to actually today's middle school uh, Long Island Science Congress fairs. Uh, I previously mentioned our robotics team. So this is our first tech robotics team uh, in the high school where students create a, a robot to uh, undergo a design task and basically a game challenge uh, where they competed in two regionals this year. What else do we have out there? Our, our Science Olympiad team, so uh, newly created this year, our Science Olympiad team uh, under the direction of Ms. Malara. Uh, they went to Syosset High School for our regional competition in, in uh, Nassau County, uh, where students had engineering challenges. They had uh, what we'll say are more traditional paper pencil events, uh, where they uh, prepare for uh, a fairly challenging exam to be done in about 50 minutes. Uh, competing against school from, schools from the region. Our engineering pre breakfast. So uh, one of the highlights uh, so far this year and continuing a tradition is having local engineers come in and actually discuss with the students what the career or what the career field of engineering looks like and the various uh, topics in engineering that students can actually go through. So our engineering students listen to a design problem that was a real challenge for a local engineer. They had 15 minutes to come up with different parameters uh, to create a solution uh, before getting the big reveal of how the company actually solved the problem that they were looking at. Then the students went into a kind of a round robin session working into individual um, workshops with the local engineers. We had them from, they were environmental engineers, uh, there were mechanical engineers, industrial engineers, and two alumni from, from Oben coming back who were inspired in their previous engineering breakfast uh, event years ago. So it was nice to again have that connection of bringing students back and really showing students, you know, this is possible and this is where you can go. All right, moving on to research. So our newly created middle-level research class uh, was engaged in the Toshiba Explorer Vision Contest earlier this year, uh, middle-level LICEF, middle-level Long Island Science Congress that they had today. Uh, we'll see what the, what the results were. Uh, several students competed in the New York City Regional Future Cities competition, uh, and I'll bring them up very briefly to, to go through their presentation. They earned second place overall in the region, first year that they were, that they were in. They also won uh, for best essay and best integration of climate change for their design, and you'll see that in a, in a second uh, as two students come up here. Um, so Eric Ravin, Luke Kugler, Sophia Staffos, and Mike Giretto Jr. Uh, was, was the team. We have two of the students uh, here tonight, and again, all through the guidance of uh, Miss Rebecca Glavin, one of our research teachers. So if Eric and Sophia, she's still here. Oh, you can come up and... Uh, 
I'll give them a few minutes to take it away. And, and, and then un unfortunately I have to come back, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll get them uh, talking first. We can't actually. Uh, good evening, board and uh, parents. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Future City Competition. So, Future City Competition is an international educational program and competition for middle school students. This program encompasses 45,000 students annually in the US, Canada, <coughs> China, Egypt, and Nigeria. Uh, the challenge begins with a simple question, and that is, how can we make the world a better place? This program is aligned with Next Generation Science Standards and the Common Core Science Standards. This program empowers students to develop research methods and design skills, problem solving, critical thinking, project and time management skills, and collaboration, and also to learn how their communities work to become more informed citizens. Students use these skills to showcase their solutions to a citywide sustainability issue. This year's challenge was to address climate change in the urban landscape. Students in this team worked with their teacher and mentor to research an urban problem and develop a solution, manage a large scale project and present their solutions to world class professionals at the competition in New York City. Eric Raven, Sophia Staffos, Mike Giretta Jr., and Luke Kugler had to write a detailed research essay, create long and short-term goals, create a project management plan for each phase of the project, stick to strict deadlines for project reflections and updates, build a model using very strict budget constraints and recycled materials to reflect implementation of their solutions to this challenge. They had to prepare a presentation and endure a whole day of judging by top researchers, engineers, and architects from the tri-state area. Their team was called the Greener Apple Team, Greener Apple meaning from you know, New York City, and um, they entered this competition at the end of January, and as Mr. Moy said, they won second place regionals, best climate change implementation, and best essay awards for 2023. Um, so first I would like to introduce um, Eric and Sophia, they're going to talk a little bit about their project, and then I'm going to introduce our mentor. Hello, so the location of our project is in the southeast end of Manhattan. And so instead of um, creating our uh, new city, we decided to rebuild one instead of creating a new one, because it's easier to visualize a city being rebuilt if you already know what it looks like currently, and also because um, the southeast end of Manhattan is in a flood zone, so we decided to tackle a issue that is happening to people and it's in real life. So um, we chose this, this location because, due to frequent floods and little. To, and there's also little to no um, historical historical landmarks, and it also helped us incorporate both water and land. So um, some concepts that we used are the super block concept, um, modular structures, and we also removed the grid the grid concept of New York City, and. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the concepts. So the super block concept allows for a more organized vertical structure of the city. So the lower levels would be storage, um, hydroponics, which is a type of farming, 
And then as you get higher and higher, you reach commercial and then residential, and then you reach our transportation methods, which I'm gonna talk about later. So we also have another um, concept, which you could see at the model back there, um, called modular structures. So this allows us to call, um, to deal with something called de-urbanization. So de-urbanization is when people move from place to place and it's super, super hard to cope with this because you can't just destroy a whole building and rebuild it because it's not profitable. So instead we made our buildings modular so we can move them from place to place. Um, and we also removed the grid concept. So the grid in New York City is basically just a giant sheet you use in math. Um, so it creates a lot of congestion and a lot of noise. So instead we scattered the buildings around and we created some more forms of transportation to move people from place to place. Um, so it would take you one minute to go 10 miles rather than uh, take 10 minutes to go one mile. Um, and then the last concept is autonomous transportation. So we use methods like a gondola, which go from building to building, and then personal drones, which could take you from one place to another super quickly. And underground, we incorporate cars. And the reason for this is because Cars create a lot of congestion and it's super hard to get from place to place if you're just using a car. It's much easier to get a vehicle for free. Um, and if you could just fly from building to building, you wouldn't have to go through roads and you also wouldn't have to go and pass people. You could just go above them or below them. So when making this project, we had a lot of struggles and so we had to work really well together and it did take a lot of time and effort and a lot of time after school. So there was 15 hours plus of this research and 20 hours plus of construction and brainstorming. So it really did take a lot of time and after working together, it was really nice and it was a great experience to have. And working on other projects like Long Island Science Congress, I found it very helpful to be able to present something like this project and to be able to answer questions like I did at this competition in New York City. So I thought it was a very nice experience to have when going to this because we got to hear from engineers that came and they told us things about our model and just overall about what it's like to be an engineer and how it was beneficial for them. Um, so concluding this presentation, I'd like to say that it was a pleasure working through uh, with my classmates. Uh, we all put in an equal amount of effort and we all worked together and collaborated and this project overall taught us discipline and it taught, taught us how to work socially and it taught us how to problem solve. Um, so I'd like to thank Ms. Glavin, which helped us a lot with the uh, presentation. And she also moderated our work to make sure we weren't um, making mistakes or to make sure everyone was collaborating as much as possible. And she really pulled us together to make sure we can complete the project on the deadline. And uh, with this project, it's not only the presentation, it's more the amount of assignments, like you have multiple writing assignments, you have multiple essays, so it's super, super hard unless you have a really good work ethic, um, which I don't think a lot of us have, unfortunately. But um, yeah, it's super, super hard to, to meet deadlines. So um, I'd just like to thank the teachers because they, they helped us do that a lot. And I, I don't think we would have won second place or we wouldn't have gone to the competition if it weren't for them. Thank you. Before we conclude, um, I just want to let you know, as part of this project, um, we had brought in uh, a mentor to work with. It's part of Future City encourages you to have a mentor. So um, just so happened at a parent-teacher conference, um, I met Mrs. Raven, and she's an architect. And I said, oh, you know, we're doing this project. Would you be willing to be the team's mentor? And she graciously accepted the challenge. She came to the class. She lectured. Um, and taught the kids about urban planning and about climate change and about the future of cities and what you know what they're doing because that's her she's a CEO of her own company she's an architect at New Habitats Architecture and uh, she was invaluable to helping us with this project so I just I wanted to let her uh, just speak for one minute about her experience working with the, with uh, the team. Uh, I feel it's very important, uh, parents being partners in the success of our students, and so I was, I was very happy to be able to bring her on board. And this is Daniela Raven. Thank you.
So good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to thank the Oyster Bay um, School District for implementing this course for the eighth graders this year. I think it was very successful, not only because of their accomplishment, but because I've heard that the upcoming eighth graders, 75% of the class have signed up to take this uh, science research, which is, I think it's phenomenal. Um, from my experience, but I, I believe other parents that have kids uh, in this class probably share the same sentiment. Um, I've seen, you know, my son flourish um, and, and develop skills that, you know, probably wouldn't, you know, start until uh, later in high school, which is, you know, it's expanding their knowledge and things that are beyond the academic curriculum, um, collaboration, you know, teamwork, and specifically public speaking, because they had to present this to, you know, beyond the borders of our district and, you know, in New York City. And I think this is a skill that will follow them throughout life, which is very important. And personally, I am, you know, thankful for Ms. Glavin for having the insight to um, acknowledge the potential of the collaboration through this five minute, you know, parent teaching conference. And also for her, you know, contagious excitement about the project who really, you know, grasped me and made me come and, and want to do this with them. And obviously, you know, as a professional, I don't have a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities to work with young um, students like that, not, you know, teenagers. And, you know, it was a great experience for me. I've learned from them. I was able to, I suppose, um, give them uh, perspective into professional life and, and things that they probably wouldn't see for, you know, a long time, if ever, unless they were in the field of architecture and urban planning. So um, I am very um, grateful and honored to have been part of uh, this, this project. And I thank, I thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you to our unofficial stage crew, as always. Official stage crew. Moving on to our high school, or one more hand for Eric and Sophia, where'd they go? Disappeared already? All right, so our high school students, uh, again, utilize equipment found in research institutions to prepare for their fairs. So they seek out and write professional emails to network with professors and other mentors in their projects. And several other students submitted to LICEF and NICEF, and Nick Ramirez actually moved on to round two. Uh, which was in person at the end of last month uh, for New York State Science and Engineering Fair, where he presented in person at the New York Hall of Science. So these students will compete in Long Island Science Congress tomorrow for the high school, uh, and the juniors will be working the next few months preparing for STS and Regeneron in, in the fall. And so there, there's Nick in the top corner. And that's science so far this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moy and the students. Congratulations on the great work. And uh, we have Ms. Beta for our humanities presentation. Good evening. I just wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present tonight so I can share with you all the wonderful things happening in the humanities department. So tonight we'll be looking at the English and Social Studies departments and the race strategy that we use, uh, as well as Nuzella. In the business department, we're going to highlight career and financial management and virtual enterprise, and then we can touch upon some social studies celebrations that you heard about from Dr. Iani before. So 
This year, we introduced the race strategy in grades 5 to 11, both in ELA and social studies. The race strategy is a method for teaching students to write well-developed, constructed responses. The acronym RACE stands for Restate, Answer, Cite, and Evidence, and Explain. It's a step-by-step -step template, and um, it teaches students how to organize their thoughts. And when resources and strategies are introduced with intention, all grade levels can build upon each other and there will be more uniform expectations. Our students have been using race and variations of it since it was introduced in the beginning of the year and it's really improved the quality of the writing. Newzella, new to the district. Newzella has just been adopted by the district. It's an online platform that provides access to a vast collection of news articles and nonfiction texts written at different reading levels, making them suitable for readers of all ages and skill level. The articles cover a wide range of topics, including science, politics, technology, sports, entertainment, among others. One of the unique features of Newzella is its ability to adjust the reading level of each article to suit the reader's individual needs. So this means that the reader or the teacher can select an article and actually adjust the reading level to match their reading ability making it easier for them to understand the content. With over 35 Oyster Bay teachers now trained to use Nuzella, teachers in ELA, social studies, and science are using it to help students improve their reading comprehension skills, content knowledge, vocabulary, and critical thinking skills. Next is the business department after these messages. Hi, hon. Is that sherbet? Yes, it is. She can finally take her vitamins. I know. Can I have some sherbet? Yes. Sherbet's pharmaceuticals. Delicious sherbet infused with nutritious vitamins. <laughs> I love sherbet. Oh so on to career and financial management, which is an essential Sherber's part of our Sherbet's Pharmaceuticals, delicious Sherbet infused with... Uh, career and financial yeah, management yeah, I, 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 is I, 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 I like that. Career 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 that, that, yeah. course that helps students to begin right, thinking ready? about career planning and lifelong goals. Students mm, uh, perform a series of self-assessments to identify what careers match their personal <laughs> interests. Pharmaceuticals. They become familiar with the job search process and learn how to transition from educational environment into a career. This process includes preparing a resume, cover letter, follow-up letter, identifying and practicing interview skills and acquisition of career-related information. Students will develop skills in communication, critical thinking, and decision-making to ensure successful employment opportunities. As you can see from the pictures, after working on their resumes and cover letters, our students dress for success and practice honing their mock interview skills. They also had the opportunity in that class to write professional business letters. So they wrote these letters to their favorite companies expressing why they love their products and requesting promotional items or memorabilia. One student who has her own small nail business wrote to some of her favorite nail companies where she expressed her love of their products. One company, Kiara Sky, was so impressed they responded with a letter and $100 worth of free merchandise. Another student wrote to Jennifer Aniston's hair care company, Lola V. She also received a personal letter and over $100 of free hair care merchandise. This is a lesson learned on the power of the pen and the value of professional writing. And up next will be our social studies celebrations after the break.
Both of these are virtual companies created in our virtual enterprise class, Sherbert Pharmaceuticals and Solar Seats. Both were featured in the LIU trade show in January. And I really wanted to thank the virtual ent enterprise teacher, Ms. Zeno and Mr. Dolan, Dolan on their cross-curricular collaboration in these commercials. They did a great job, so another round of applause. Thank you. So we'll go through this briefly because, as I said, it was already mentioned. This was the first grade social studies night at TR, compliments of Principal McElwee, and it was on March 30th. This is their second year of its inception. You can just take a look at some of the pictures. They made their own teddy bears. They did their teddy uh, observations pigskin notebooks, and then they acted as conserva uh, conser uh, conservationists, and as you can see, the agenda in the middle. Uh, next, we have our American Revolution. Uh, this was actually a, um, another celebration, and this is a movie clip from Miss Griffin's class, fourth grade class. Nope. Welcome back. Not that one. Fourth grade American Revolution. There it is. There, that's better. So here are some visuals. Using 21st century learning tools such as Kahoot, QR codes, Book Creator, Google Slides, and Google Forms, the students, with the help of their teachers and the support of Brian Agostini, who's amazing, by the way, they were really able to showcase their learning, and it was an amazing event, and we love to see the students take such pride in their work. And then for sixth grade, we were invited to the Ancient, Civiliz uh, the Ancient Civilization Day on March 31st. Students shared what they learned about ancient Rome, Greece, China, and Egypt. They replicated famous places like the Parthenon and the Acropolis and the Temple of Horus, and they dressed up like Cleopatra, King Tut, and Aphrodite. Students had the opportunity to present their research, and then everyone ate foods reminiscent of ancient times. And you can see some of their creations. They were fantastic. And then you have Addison. Hopefully this works. Addison decided she was going to do a flip grid and hopefully it'll work and you get to see about 20 seconds of it. Welcome back to Ancient Egypt Talk Show. Today we will be starring the one and only Hatshepsut. Unfortunately, she can't be here for the in-person interview because she's all the way in Egypt. So we're going to be doing it through Zoom. Hatshepsut, are you there? Does this work? Is this even working? Okay, I think it's good. Well. Hey everybody, I'm glad I'm here to talk with all of you guys and share my story. I was honestly regretting this for a little while because I heard that you guys interviewed <sighs> Butmos III. Do you know what he has done to me? He tried erasing me, Hatshepsut, the most successful ruler in history. He tried erasing me from history. And to make matters worse, he almost destroyed my entire temple. The indignity. And you might recognize some of these children representing our uh, school community. 
And you can see that we've aligned everything we do in humanities to the Board of Education goals. As we continue to enhance our curriculum and our K-12 programs, the race strategy is helping to improve writing district-wide. We're infusing more technology to enhance teaching and learning. We are making real-world connections and making learning more authentic and relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Now we have Ms. Raynor for the budget, final budget presentation before the budget hearing. So this evening, uh, this is the fourth budget presentation I'm proud to present before tonight's adoption on the board agenda. Um, always maintaining our vision of empowering all students to achieve excellence, which was the nice reminder of seeing all the students today in the presentation today of why we do what we do, all the work the Board of Education, our administrators, and our entire team do for the budget to provide these students with these opportunities. So the focus for this year has been to stay within the allowable tax levy cap to align the resources for these opportunities for the students, as well as maintaining the routine maintenance on our buildings. Tonight's presentation, as Dr. Yanni just said, is the final presentation before the budget adoption. Uh, as a reminder, all of these presentations, as well as all the additional budget information, is posted to the website for your uh, review. Starting with the points of pride, as I said, it's so important that we keep our students centered in the focus of everything we do, including building this budget. Um, here are just some of the highlights from this year, um, including the digital literacy skills that have been integrated into all levels of instruction, the completion of the field, uh, the full pep rally, the Friday night light scheme, um, our scholar athletes, School of Excellence, uh, as well as many others you see up there. Going to the budget summary for next year, the 23-24 budget, you'll see, simply put, the revenues do equal the expenses. So going into details of both sides of this, I will, uh, over the next few slides, go into the details, starting with the revenue side of the budget. You can see here that the revenue side of the budget primarily comes from our tax levy at just slightly over 88%. This year presented a great challenge because as we all know, the CPI was at 8% this year as dictated by the Office of State Comptroller. With the tax levy uh, allowable limit cap at 2%, our expenses are going up uh, upwards of six, seven, eight percent while we are capped at the 2% into our uh, formula. So for the Oyster Bay East Norwood School District, in putting that information, the allowable levy, which is the lesser of the two of the 2% uh, compared to the eight, our allowable tax levy for the 23-24 budget is 2.34%. So as I said in the focus, that's been a, a primary concern for us. This is the details of the revenue budget. Again, within that allowable cap, we have maintained that 2.34%. You'll see our state aid right on the top is very minimal. We are, we are one of the few districts in Nassau County that is on our hold harmless of the 3% minimum increase in aid. Um, our strong financial position has allowed us to continue to appropriate reserves and appropriate fund balance to stay within the cap year after year. Um, and you see the tax levy at the bottom, again, in, within that 2.34%. This is the overall budget that is presented this evening for the adoption at the tax levy of uh, almost $57 million and the revenue from non-tax levy such as um, miscellaneous um, revenue, income tax, and lease agreements is about $7.5 million. That proposed budget for 23-24 is $64,414,491. Looking at the expense side of the budget, which does equal those revenues, is the details here. You will see on the second, first and second lines that our salaries and wages and our benefits uh, are the primary uh, source of the expense for the district. The biggest this year you will see the increase, as most of us are aware of, is the health insurance increased costs that we are seeing um, takes up over a million dollars worth of the increase of this budget alone. Put visually to kind of see where that lies in terms of the whole budget, you see the blue part is our salaries and our wages, the red is our benefits, and the transportation is the third largest chunk of this uh, pie. This is the overall budget to budget comparison from this year to uh, last year, a slight difference of about $2.3 million. Again, the majority of that being the salaries and benefits, uh, primarily health insurance. Also on the ballot, you'll see the capital reserves, which I've presented in the past. Those have maintained the same. Um, 
through long-term financial planning, we've been able to use the reserves every year, fund the reserves to make sure we have a strong financial position to continue the maintenance of our buildings as we go through, um, as we've even discussed in this building, the 1929 building, there's certain repairs that just need to get done to maintain the building into the condition it's in. So specifically this year, you'll see on the ballot preposition, um, the capital projects at the high school, uh, a main entrance seating wall, which I'll show in just a second, um, continuing phase two of the project in here, the auditorium and sound lighting upgrades that we've uh, started, the tennis courts lighting, which was uh, help us for the tennis course matches specifically in the fall when our tennis uh, teams are playing and it gets darker a lot earlier. They are sometimes playing in the dark. So the tennis courts just for those matches to be able to um, allow our students to not have to go off site um, when it's uh, later in the fall. Uh, the replacement of the marquee sign up at front is quite old and only represents the high school, not the middle school as well for this building. At Vernon, there's some HVAC work, including ceiling and lighting replacement, and the unit over the library at Vernon, which is partially funded that we do have that preliminary grant approval, so we do expect that reimbursement after the completion of the project. At Memorial Stadium, there's some minor concrete repairs and building repairs, just to, again, keep the building in a strong condition. And at the administration building, there's an HVAC that has well extended its, its life expectancy. So you'll see a total of $750,000 proposed for all of these projects on your ballot. Uh, the one I want to go into a little bit further detail um, for the students is that main entrance seating wall. This is a picture if you're standing on McCoon's Lane looking up at that main entrance up the ramp towards a circle. Um, most of you who have seen there after school, you see a lot of students um, gathering, um, hanging out on that grass hill. Um, this will create like a stepped plaza type uh, plaza style seating wall um, for students to be able to gather there off of the ramp and off of McCoon's Lane to give them a safe space. Also, you'll see on the ballot, proposition number two will represent the technology projects, which will help fund our long-term technology plan, um, specifically the one-to-one -one device program for our students. Um, as we've discussed, students at TR have iPads in kindergarten, first, and second grade. In third grade, they are issued Chromebooks. Uh, up until this year, they were issued a new Chromebook in seventh grade. We are extending that to, fifth, uh, to eighth grade to make sure they get the full five years through their senior year. Um, for the Chromebooks, as well as continue to do some replacement of older interactive boards in the classrooms. So that is the $200,000 for the capital project on that ballot. Just to provide some information back on our vote, you can see here um, a multi-year look back with the second column showing the budget increase where we've been able to create a very long-term financial stable um, budget to budget increase every year, as well as the, the votes that we've uh, received every year for that for those budgets. This information, again, is on the website, so you can preview it before you come to vote the day of the, ele um, day of the vote on May 16th. You'll see Proposition 1 is the budget that I just described. Proposition 2 is the technology just described. And Proposition 3 are those capital projects I just described. We are continuing on our timeline um, as we start this presentation. This is the fourth presentation. Tonight is the budget adoption. I will, again, provide an overview of the budget on the May 2nd, which is the night of the budget hearing, um, concluding with the vote on the 16th, uh, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the high school chorus room, which is where it's been held the uh, past few years. Any voting information um, on the screen and also on the website, you will see the district clerk's information up there. Please remind, uh, be remembered that the last day to register to vote is May 11th. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks, Ms. Rayner. Um, let's move on to the approval of minutes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes as listed and attached um, below? So um, moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Now we're moving on to the opportunity for the public to be heard on agenda items. In accordance with the open meeting law, school board meetings where school district business will be discussed are open to the public. The Oyster Bay East Norwich Board of Education welcomes public comment at its meetings. The Board of Education will respond to comments and or inquiries in the appropriate manner. This portion of the meeting is designed exclusively for agenda items. A sign and book is provided for those residents wishing to address the board. In order to be recognized, you must be signed in. Each speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes. The board president will call you to the microphone in the order in which you have signed in. Public discussion is prohibited. 
regarding matters related to an individual's reputation, privacy, or right to due process, which in some way could be violated. A second commentary period is provided for non-agenda items prior to adjournment. We thank you for your participation and cooperation. Is there anybody that signed in for, um, no? Okay. okay, let's move on to instructional personnel items. Resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District, hereby approves the, approves the instructional personnel, personnel items as listed in their entirety. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Let's move on to non-instructional personnel items. Resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the non-instructional personnel items as listed in their entirety. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Let's move on to business items and approval of business items. Resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the business items as listed in their entirety. Do I have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Let's move on to special services. Resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the special services resolution as listed in their entirety. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Let's move on to a, um, new business. Resolved upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education of the Oyster Bay East Norwich Central School District hereby approves the new business resolutions as listed in their entirety. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Aye. 13 items for discussions. Letter to the governor, high density housing plan. Um, we have proposed a letter to the governor objecting to the high density housing plan. Do we have a, do we have a I've provided a copy to everyone on the, on the board, and I want to make sure that everyone um, uh, approves of this. This is this is um, writing to express our strong opposition to the New York Housing Compact um, and in any effort to include this provision in the budget. Does everyone approve of sending this letter? Yes. Yes. Approved. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move on to public participation of non-agenda items. Has anybody, oh, yes. Mr. William Ruff. Good evening. Um, you probably remember I was here about four weeks ago. I'm back. Um, brought to the board's attention and looking for some solutions or kind of some information about why the leadership team of Oyster Bay High School did not field a junior varsity baseball team. Didn't hear anything. So brought some more information. Seventh grade has 24 players. Eighth grade has 11 players and the varsity has 20 players. That's a total of 55 student athletes playing baseball Oyster Bay. But yet this leadership team at Oyster Bay for the first time in history said they couldn't field a JV team. Now some of you who are familiar with baseball has to play the game to get better. I've attended some of the varsity games and it's a it's a shame. And as a school it's embarrassing. I've been to some other varsity games at other schools. Last night at Cold Spring Harbor. I have parents from other teams that I know because of travel baseball saying, why aren't you fielding a team? Now, Miss Santos, your husband started uh, the Oyster Bay baseball team, right? Here. Darren Jabozzi, who sits on the board, picks it up. 
works endless to supply athletes to this school. But yet we're not capable of fielding a team. But there's no answer yet. I don't understand why there's no answer to the public. And I call that an epic failure of this school. And it's, we can't do anything about it now. But what this board needs to do is make sure it never happens again. Our students deserve better. You know, I hear, I've had some really great conversations with Dr. Yanni, some people on the board. I've had pretty good conversations with Eric Bremoff, athletic driver, uh, director. Some of them haven't been so good. But this needs to be run like a business sometimes. Now, I know you and I don't agree with that, but I'm from the corporate world as a CEO. And with a budget of $64 million, we need answers. The student athletes are your customers. The board of directors are the parents. And we cannot allow this to happen. There's no reason whatsoever for us not to have a JB baseball team this year. And what's going to happen next year is that you got kids not seeing the field at a varsity level. 20 kids. And that's unacceptable. Again, I'm going to ask this Board of Education to bring us some answers. Everybody has our emails. There's no reason for us not to have answers. I would have thought I at least got an email from somebody on this board, or maybe from Dr. Yanni, or maybe from Eric Brimmer, but nothing, because you want it to go away. It seems to be a pattern here, and it has to stop. Our kids deserve better. Parents deserve better. So I'm hoping, as a second request to this Board of Education, to the senior leadership of this school that we have some answers because the numbers are there the numbers are there we were told I was told personally that the numbers weren't there we couldn't field a team and that's a lie so let's find the truth we all make mistakes we're human but let's find the truth and make sure it doesn't happen again because our kids deserve better, and that's your customers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruff. Yep. So, Mr. Ruff, we have uh, we had many conversations, and uh, I think that transparency on behalf of this entire team is not an issue. I believe we've been very transparent. We've been meeting with you multiple times, but uh, you don't need a second request because. The answer was provided to you at the time that we met with Mr. Bramoff and myself, and we gave explanation. The explanation is very simple. The explanation is that the recommendation from Mr. Bramoff for the safety of the students, the well-being of the students, and the safety, long-term safety of the program was necessary to fill three teams, the varsity team, the eighth grade team, the seventh grade team. At this time, you as a parent, uh, some other parents may not agree with that decision, but that was a recommendation that was given by Mr. Bramoff, was shared all the details, and he's the athletic director. He's looking at the long-term program. He explained the reason. We explained to you the reason. You know that. I know that. And that was the decision made. Unfortunately, in my job, right, the one thing that I have that is going against me that I cannot put the toothpaste back in the tube. One thing that you have a valid point and the board took action on it is the fact that the board was not aware that that team was not filled. So when you brought up the point at the last board meeting discussing the fact that the board was not aware, the board understood that, the board and I don't want to speak for the board, but they appreciated the fact that you verbalized this issue and made a decision 
in tonight's board meeting on policy 7410 that moving forward, there will be no elimination or, or not filling of a team unless the board will approve it. I think that's an impressive move on the board to change a policy to rectify this problem. So to answer your question, that will never happen again. The, 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 what the board did was something impressive because from one board meeting to another, I've, I've been a superintendent for a few years now. I never seen this. So I'm proud to work for this board, for this community. So that will never happen again because I will not be in violation of a policy. But what I could tell you is that I'm not a baseball guy. I'm a runner, I'm a cycling, I'm a swimmer, and I'm not an athlete. I'm just an amateur. But I could tell you that based on the explanation, you agree at the time that it was explained to you, it was not safe to fill a JV varsity team. Now, we can sit down over here. I I'm sorry. Let me, let me finish. Let, I, I'll let you I didn't stop you. Now, so let me finish. I am not, I am not sitting over here discussing the recommendation of the athletic director and the reason why or why not and filling in and not filling. What I could tell you is that the big picture over here is that it will never happen again that the board will be surprised at a board meeting that a team is not going to be filled. I think that's an impressive decision on the board. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, that ends tonight's meeting. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Everybody. Good night.